So uh, we are delighted to be joined by Dennis Richard, a playwright. Uh, he has written Ethel and Julius about the Rosenberg trial. Uh, he has written Oswald, the actual interrogation about uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, the game against Bobby Fischer, and uh, about 60 other plays. And uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Dennis for a few decades in the business context. And then I was delighted to learn about his second career as a playwright. So, Dennis, welcome to the program. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. What a fascinating journey you've had uh, from a successful entrepreneur, a broadcaster, businessman in the insurance and other fields. How is it that you were able to scratch that itch and become a playwright as well? Well, playwriting for me goes back to 1972, and uh, I've been writing since then. I've written almost 60 plays, and uh, it's the same force uh, for writing that I have in the business world. I do them all at the same time. I love the fact, because I'm a pop culture and U.S. history buff, I love the fact that, I mean, the subject matter you've picked, uh, the Bobby Fischer story, I mean, when I was in college, it was just an obsession following yeah, Bobby Fischer absolutely. against Spassky. I mean, it was a huge, it was kind of like the O.J. deal. People, right. even though obviously nobody could, you know, you could barely tell how a rook moved versus a knight, but still, we got caught up in it. Uh, and then Lee Harvey Oswald, I was stunned to learn through reading your play and, and, and further about it, the Dallas cops didn't record, they didn't take notes, well, no formal the, record of the interrogation. There's a reason for that. Uh, uh, they ordered a uh, tape recorder. It had not come at the time of the assassination. Can you imagine? Right? Can you believe and that? The, no, I, uh, uh, Jim Lavelle, I spoke to him, who was the, uh, yeah, a little closer to the, the uh, uh, fellow who was handcuffed to Oswald in the morning Jack Ruby sh uh, shot him. Uh, he came as my guest of honor for the... Was uh, he the guy in the white hat in the pictures? Yes, correct, yeah. yeah. When my play was uh, in Fort Worth, uh, Jim was my guest of honor. And I asked him, Jim, what, uh, how come? No uh, recordings, no? said, we had ordered the tape recorder. Wow, just incredible. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so now uh, you have written Ethel and Julius. Uh, I have read the draft of the play. It's a work in progress, and it, it's remarkable. Uh, I, I hope when you finish it, uh, it hits with a huge splash. So just to, to kind of give folks a little bit of context, uh, people know about Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. What they know generally is, oh, yeah, the Cold War um, stole American nuclear secrets. Uh, they were executed. There was a question about their guilt. Uh, well, probably Julius was guilty. Who knows about Ethel? And then there were some Soviet cables that were decrypted decades later that suggested, well, maybe she was guilty, too. And, and as I understand it, there was a connection with this uh, German scientist, Klaus Fuchs. Uh, he was caught as a, as a spy. He fingered somebody named Gold as uh, his courier. Gold confessed and identified uh, David Greenglass as his source. Greenglass, as it turns out, was Ethel's brother. Then, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Th then uh, Julius is fingered by David and you know he was involved supposedly and then of course you've got a, a Roy Cohn connection uh, so that, that's Very those are the basics story. those are the basics tell us how you approached this complex slice of American history and what did you want to convey what was your in your mind in terms of a take on, on this it couldn't be a more dramatic story this husband and wife with, with two little sons wound up being executed well I'm three and a half years into writing this play and uh, um, it uh, has been a real journey in many, many ways. It's a complicated story. It's uh, hidden, based, uh, hidden in, um, in, in our history. And Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were the only two Americans ever executed for espionage. Very complicated story. Russian collusion back there Russian in 1951. Yeah, in and um, uh, Rosenberg uh, was later with the Venona transcripts, which were released in 1997, that in essence he was a Russian spy but for uh, Ethel, it sh uh, showed that she was non-active, and um, yet in the end, they both uh, went to the um, execution chamber. So and how they got there was, uh, we're talking about 1951 now, March of 1951, the trial took about three weeks, and then it was two and a half years of stays and denials uh, before they were finally sent to the execution chamber. So the Cold War climate in the United States, of course, people know about McCarthyism and the McCarthy era, and, it, and it's been a source of controversy mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the sense that whereas most people generally believe, yeah, McCarthy was a bad guy, he was a demagogue, you still see people on the conservative side of the ledger 
that kind of support him. Back, for example, in the 50s, William Buckley and a colleague wrote a book called McCarthy and His Enemies. And the message was, mm, yes, he had some suspicious methods and over the top, but, but basically he was onto something very important. Communism was a really awful thing. Fast forward now, very recently, one of Ann Coulter's books, she comes out every couple of years with a book, had a, a, a big focus on the fact that, you know, McCarthy basically got it right. So you jump into this controversy. Is your focus in Ethel and Julius to to look at the, the demagoguery of the McCarthy era? Is your focus to raise questions as to whether there really was absolutely solid proof of guilt against both Ethel and Julius? What was your theme? There? Well, very simply, this was all about the atomic bomb and then later the hydrogen bomb. But to put it historically, uh, in, 19, in, the, in World War II, the Russians and the Americans were allies. In 1945, the war ended, and then in 1946, uh, it, the Cold War uh, term was, uh, was used. And uh, we had, the United States had atomic supremacy. Uh, so all that was going on and at the same time in the in uh, a body a dead body of a russian soldier was found on um, the battlefield and it contained a notebook and in that notebook was a russian code that took the united states army two years to uh, decode when they did finally decode it uh, it all of the russian spies were there and certainly at the top of the ring in new york city was julius rosenberg but understand from uh, 1945 on, we had supremacy in, in theory of, the, of nuclear, nuclear supremacy. However, in 1949, the Russians detonated their own atomic bomb, which then led Truman to say, we, the United States, are now going to put Mike into action, and Mike was the hydrogen bomb. Now, 49... What, what is that? Is it M-I-K? Is it, was it an acronym for something? Mike? Mike, well, that was the code name Just they used. Just a nickname. Used. Yeah, nickname they used. Now we're in 1950... Uh, with the Cold War is going on, all the, the Russians are all over the United States. Uh, remember Alger Hiss and uh, Whitaker Chambers with two people placed in high uh, in the State Department, I believe, uh, and they were Russian spies. Okay, so now here we are in 1950. Julius Rosenberg, the code is broken. Nobody knows about the code being broken because it's a secret. The, go the government doesn't want the Russians to know we've broken right. the code. So here we go now with uh, Julius Rosenberg, who gets arrested. Shortly there, in Mar I believe in March of 1950. Shortly thereafter, Ethel Rosenberg is arrested. Now, 1951, a terrible, terrible time to be uh, a Russian spy. Height of McCarthy. Right? right, exactly right. Okay, so now the trial goes on for three weeks, and the government presents its case. For the Rosenbergs, for the most part, pleaded the fifth through the entire three-week process. And in the end, um, the Judge Kaufman uh, pronounced the death penalty against the uh, Rosenberg. So the suggestion of all the evidence, including these new cables, as you said, that were decrypted. Well, there was very little evidence against and that's where the I was Rosenbergs. Going to go. we, and we, we, hardly we, anything against Ethel, except that David Greenglass, her brother, states that uh, my sister Ethel typed up notes. So, uh, and by the way, we are talking with Dennis Richard. Uh, he's the playwright of uh, Julia, Ethel and Julius. So that's where I was going to head. Uh, we look at it now objectively with the benefit of history and all the evidence, and it looks like uh, they were guilty. In what sense w did it seem that they were being railroaded? Because there's a suggestion in your play that it wasn't exactly a fair proceeding. Uh, well, the trial that resulted there's a, there's in a death a lot, sentence. There's a lot, it's a great question. There's a lot of conjecture, but it appeared that the government did want to make scapegoats out of the Rosenbergs. And uh, Hoover has been quoted many times as saying, let's use Ethel as a lever to get Can Julius Can I ask a question? Rosenberg why would, why would they do that? Well, it's a real quick history lesson. <laughs> the, 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 the main theory to that is we, they needed a scapegoat of some kind. Okay. Okay, but again, a lot of this is lost in history, and there are many, many uh, variations and, and, and stories about it, but essentially, were they railroaded in, up to the point in which they, wa they, were, they, they were pronounced guilty by a judge who technically could not even pronounce that guilty plea because of the Atomic Energy Act of 1948 or 49? Okay, uh, then there's the whole issue of anti-Semitism. Uh, were they railroaded because, because of that? Because they were Jewish, yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, okay, but, but so I've had to take this 
vast body of knowledge, if you will, and try and condense it down to explain to a, an audience what exactly led up to the Rosenberg arrest, who were the Rosenbergs, uh, and um, how did, in the end, they walk into and leave their children. Well, or having read the draft of the play, you do a marvelous job of, of, of uh, exactly that. Let me ask you about the issue of um, them possibly saving their lives, because you, mm -hmm. you touch in the play on the idea that the government went to them after they'd been pronounced, uh, right. given the uh, order of death. Uh, well, you know, you can save yourself uh, mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. play ball with us, and, mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't. Uh, is it your sense that they didn't have any names to hand over? Oh, or, no. Or they oh, could have done not. it, no, but this, they this was, refused to do that. No. From what I have learned, they embraced Russian ideology over everything. We are not going to talk. There was a bona fide offer by the Justice Department. Um, you'll live if you give us names. I'm sure Julius had plenty of names. To what extent Ethel Rosenberg was actually a spy, it remains to be seen. But they walked into that execution chamber when they did not have to. Now, uh, and the, that shocks people, yeah, especially absolutely. for the issue of the wife, the mother. Yeah, because the uh, two little sons were, yeah, were still exactly. there. Exactly. And then there's the yeah. issue of whether the two lawyers were in over their heads, a small law firm battling the Justice Department. A including Roy Cohn. Now, we touched right. on the... Was, was he a government lawyer at the time? He was the assistant DA assistant. in the Southern District of New York. Of New York. Southern District. That right. sounds familiar now. Southern right, District right. of New York, <laughs> doesn't it? Huh? And again, with okay. the Russian collusion angle, you, you mentioned earlier, sort of linking the decades here. And Roy Cohn is kind of a Zelig figure, that you're popping up anywhere and everywhere in history, because as we know, Roy Cohn for years was Donald Trump's fixer before Michael Cohen came Correct. along. Right. Before that, he was the prime aid for Joe McCarthy and of course is seen right there in the famous 1954 Army McCarthy hearings where McCarthy McCarthy was exposed right. to the world as a demagogue and and Cohn is there whispering and so on but before that before McCarthy I didn't realize until reading your play that he was involved in, in pushing the prosecution of right. the Rosenberg. It's sketchy from what I've been able to find about Roy Cohen but Roy Cohen has stated uh, that he res was responsible for convincing Judge Kaufman to issue the death sentence mm -hmm. on the Rosenberg. Who, who, now, what's that about? How does now, the now, district now, attorney happened, convince an, the judge to do that? It's an ex parte that's, that's situation. Yeah. For, for sure. Okay. If and for you non-lawyers non out there, ex parte should means not have been meeting with the judge alone. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know that. But, yeah, okay. Yeah. Now, who, who was real quick? Who was Judge Kaufman in this case? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Judge, no, that's okay. Ir judge Irving Kaufman was the presiding judge in the of the Rosenberg well, I, case. Correct. And they picked him because. Oh well, he. I think he was assigned the case. Okay, sorry. And then the Irving Sapol was the district attorney, mm -hmm. and the two and uh, Manny Block was the um, defense attorney, along with his father. Uh, and Manny represented uh, Julius. His father represented Ethel and Gloria Agrin, who was in my play. Uh, she was wow. an assistant uh, to them. But. Uh, uh, what I didn't know, Roy Cohen was uh, actually was he a fixture for Trump? Not to drag Trump into this. Yeah, but, uh, he he, he was Donald Trump's personal lawyer for I'm going to say in the 70s and 1980s. Yeah, you wouldn't think that long, right? I mean, that's uh, wow. Correct, correct. And then David Greenglass. Apparently, um, lying about his sister being a Russian spy, uh, had got 15 years. His wife Ruth received uh, nothing, and uh, I believe, and when he came out at uh, the end of 15 years, he said, "I've told the truth." But then years later on his deathbed, he said, I lied. My sister was not a spy. So, but it goes back to Ethel did not have to walk into that. She didn't that have to do it. Well, uh, what, what year were they executed? What year? Were they executed in 51? No. The, 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 the 51 was the trial, March, and then about two and a half years of stays and denials okay. to try and get the Rosenbergs uh, off. Maybe a little off topic, and it probably is, but how is this linked to the Hollywood 10 and the, and the, and the HUAC hearings and all of that stuff? Is it, is it linked at all? I because it gets into Soviet, you know, it's the same, communism. The same yeah, climate I, uh, about anti-communism. It was just the, old, the yeah, overall correct, climate yeah. was came well, that came later. One of somebody in my play, one one of the characters, it was aligned with the uh, had something to do with the Hollywood Ten, I believe. And was that before or after? I now I want to say it was before, like 1947, but I'm not certain yeah, myself. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and all yeah. the blacklisting that came with that. Yeah, yeah. Terrible. It thing. was a horrible time to be a suspected spy. So and remember, people were building. Uh, bomb shelters, people were building, right. uh, blacking out their walls. I've spoken to people mm -hmm. who've moved out of New York City with canned goods in their car because uh, they thought New York City was going to be bombed. We had over 50 cities that Russia could bomb. 
They only had two, Leningrad and, and uh, Moscow. We're talking with Dennis Richard, playwright, author of Ethel and Julius, as well as Oswald, the actual interrogation and the game against Bobby Fischer. Tell me what, how you deal with the fact that, to a degree, you can reconstruct actual conversations and be pretty true to them through reading and research and transcripts. But I gotta assume that there are a lot of conversations, lines uh, that you can't really trace to original research sources. So how do you do that and still, in your mind, <clears throat> remain true to to I, history? I would say, yeah, being remaining true to history is key, and I really faced this problem with the Oswald uh, play that I wrote. Right. Uh, uh, right. Over eighty percent of the Ethel and Julius lines that they speak personally, uh, they uh, are documented that they said. That was testimony. Was that? Yes. That well, no, testimony? not only testimony. Uh, to, to, I read uh, 1,200 pages of, um, of transcripts, uh, but I was able to piece together, well, there's the death house letters. And in the death house letters, they were, uh, they were able to write letters to themselves. They went, the, the, the uh, book was published, the Rosenberg death house letters, and back and forth were lots of quotes, lots of things about you know, what Ethel felt at the time, Julius felt, and I've integrated those things that I thought were salient into the play. But I was, re you can't do this and not be true to history because sooner or later the critics are going to jump all over it and say, that really never happened, okay? So I had to go into this and, and say, I've got to remain true to history. All right, Dennis Richard, author of Ethel and Julius, uh, he is finalizing the play, so hopefully it'll be in a theater near you soon. Also, Oswald, the actual interrogation, and the game against Bobby Fischer. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so best much. Best of luck on the play. Pleasure. Thank you so much. When we come back, Bill Cosby on the grill. We'll be back on CRN with the Royal Oak Show. <laughs>